Hi everybody and welcome to our webinar on inclusive design and accessibility. But first let me tell you a bit about, about Wiseline. We're a software development company where we build products and services in collaboration with their clients to help them reach their goals by leveraging uh, business and users' needs. We're a global company with our headquarters in San Francisco, offices in Highland in Bangkok, and Ho Chi Minh here in Vietnam, and in Guadalajara, Mexico City, and Querétaro in Mexico, and in Barcelona, Spain, um, and with representatives in Australia and uh, some other cities in the United States. Something that's, that really speaks about the culture here at Wiseline is the value that we um, and the praise that we have about teaching and learning. So um, we really put an effort into sharing some knowledge and with that intention, Academy was launched in July 2016. Since that time, well, we've delivered more than 100 courses and have presence in more than eight cities. We believe that this program really contributes to the cities where we're in and also helps build and encourage and grow the ecosystems uh, that surround our offices. So uh, our, our courses are usually in person, that grand panorama uh, has made us be much more creative in the way that we share knowledge. So hopefully you will enjoy the session and just leave comments and feedback here on the channel. Hi everybody, and before starting our talk today, uh, we'd like to share with you some uh, our Academy uh, Code of Conduct. So to make everything going well, we are going to ask you to be respectful, because not all of us agree all the time, but this agreement is not uh, an excuse for uh, poor manners or behaviors. Secondly, be welcoming and patient. So we strive to be a community that welcomes and supports people of all backgrounds and identities. And finally, be careful in the words that you choose, because we are a community of professionals and we conduct ourselves also professionally. Well, with that being said, let's just begin with the topic I'm about today. So my name is Christina. I'm a senior UX designer here at Wexline. And as a UX, uh, I guess that I give guidance and direction to the business that I work with uh, by uh, sharing some insights into the product definition and allowing them to make better decisions that will improve their business goals and uh, eventually users' life. I'm also studying my master's degree in sexuality and gender equality, which gives me uh, a lot of motivation and it's definitely one of my passions. So I'm very excited to be talking to you today about inclusion and design, which are both of my biggest interests. Um, and hopefully by the end of this talk, I'll share some light into how to create products that really make a, a meaningful improvement. And my name is Andrea. I'm also a senior UX designer at Wiseline. So I use service design tools to identify improvement opportunities, taking into account um, my clients' business goals, technical constraints, and of course, users' needs. And all along with my working experience as a designer, I had the opportunity uh, to design for a large uh, spectrum of uh, contexts and users. This has made me being interested in accessibility and inclusion approach. Moreover, my participation in volunteer programs around the world uh, involving um, people with disabilities allow me to make a shift in my mindset and being conscious of uh, how important and necessary is to take into account these humans that are not being considered as normal by our society. So I expect to share with you a part of my knowledge and experience to build products and services available to all. Wonderful. Uh, FYI, we're here in one of our offices in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, 
So if you see people walking around behind us, it's because it's just a regular office there here in Vietnam. Now about the agenda, we'll first start defining and finding the differences between inclusion and accessibility. And then go through some of the benefits of implementing this uh, philosophy and this process into or day to day as designers. Then discuss the current panorama. Why is this actually necessary or we sh what we should would be uh, consider in having this. Then uh, some principles and examples about inclusive design. After that, uh, go through the accessibility guidelines and best practices. And last but not least, we'll guide you through some uh, an exercise that we both prepared. And hopefully, you'll have the chance to do this at home. So, what does each of these uh, big words mean? So, for starters, inclusive design is a methodology, a philosophy. It enables and draws on the full range of human diversity. This means that it considers the different dimensions of the human experience, and it's about include, including and learning from others, even though that they have a different perspective or are living under a different circumstance and have very diverse aspirations. In comparison, accessibility can. Accessibility is an attribute that clarifies um, an experience open to all. So when we say uh, that the website is accessible, it means that the site content is available um, for uh, everybody and its functionality can be operated by literacy anyone, including individuals uh, who have visual, motor, cognitive speech disabilities. Moreover, accessibility is also a professional discipline aimed at achieving an experience open to all. So let's take a look at this schema. Uh, inclusive design embraces and takes into account human aspect, aspects like um, the gender identity or expression, the spoken languages, the age, the education background, the location, or even the morphology. All these dimensions, aspects that enable us to define a, a human being. While inclusive design doesn't stop there, it also includes the visual, physically, cognitive, auditory, uh, human abilities. So all of these abilities that can become contextual, temporary or permanent disabilities are the spot of the accessibility discipline. So that means that a website that is qualified with the accessibility attribute doesn't have to be inclusive. However, the inclusive design approach takes into account these users experience that uh, are experiencing some uh, disabilities. So it takes into account the accessibility guidelines. So we're going to talk about this in a few minutes. Perfect. And well, here's a big statement. So inclusive design and accessibility really work together and they make experiences that are not only compliant with standards and guidelines that are specific for our industry, but they true they're truly inclusive and open for everybody. Let's go ahead. Why it matter? So the world is changing and the products and services we build need to represent our current reality and aim for a better future. So that means that through the products we build, we teach by example and um, also promote social change. Definitely. We were speaking the other day on why, why were we actually giving this talk? And at the end, I think that this speaks for <laughs> Andreas and my own values that we really want to make a difference in people's lives and strive for a better and brighter future. So why should we consider designing through inclusive design practices? Simply because it pays off in many ways in terms of innovation, of brand reputation, or market reach. So let's dig uh, deeper into each of these elements. So firstly, we should consider it 
to drive innovation. So taking the time to produce around, around these guidelines is what pushes designers and engineers to become even better. So it forced us to build useful platforms that attract and support many other demographics. And we cover uh, a large range of variations and constraints. So it encouraged us um, a new way of thinking. Definitely. And it's definitely and it's, uh, an opportunity to provide solutions for unmet needs for some of our users. And maybe find something that's just new in the market. And we should also consider it uh, to announce uh, our brand. Because uh, what we design is a byproduct of our mindset, methods, and behaviors. So it talks about our brand and our company. So if when the experience provided is useful, usable, and memorable, our brand image improves, our notoriety also uh, improves, and more people will join us. Definitely. And I think that to one extent, it helps you build an emotional bridge with your brand. So uh, something that's interesting is that brands live from the perspective and from the perceptions that other individuals have on that. So by introducing yourself as a brand that takes into account this diversity that's out there, you can be much more human and have a more noble presence. So, so at, the same, at the same time, we are increasing uh, the market reach. We are not around and we increase the market reach. So if our experience is solving someone's needs and extends to others' needs, our target spectrum expands. And this is something that we'll be talking about shortly as we get, go deeper into inclusive design. But there's this quote that I really love that it's from Microsoft uh, Design Tools and Inclusive Design, and they just suggest that um, solve for for the few and you solve for the many because you find ways to to link different experiences. And by designing for somebody with a permanent disability, at the end you can also benefit uh, somebody who's living a situational uh, disability. And finally, we should consider it to reduce business risk. So in particular, it can reduce the risk of costly and unwanted problems later in the product development life cycle. For example, excessive customer service, service costs, lawsuits, uh, costly rectification work after land, also customer dissatisfaction or brand degradation. There are cases uh, where people have shoot corporations for their inability to accommodate their website uh, to those who may be using their service. For example, a client with a vision impairment, cognitive impairment, shoot Domino's Pizza because he wasn't able to order a pizza online, and uh, of course the, the client uh, will trust the case. Yeah. You know, I love this example because it just shows us how the panorama and the, the legal perspective is even changing mm -hmm. in terms of who are we including or excluding through design. So moreover, all these reasons, considering a large spectrum of users with their characteristics, provides us a swift in our culture and ourselves. It leads a change in the way we are watching the world and its human diversity. So, fun fact, we were talking about this topic with our friend Maybeth, who's a technical writer here in Vietnam. <laughs> and in a simplistic view, why should we talk about this? Because we're good people. Because we're good <laughs> persons. And it's just a simplistic way of putting it, but it also adds much more purpose in what we do every day. So let me tell you more about the current panorama. So these are some uh, context and data that we gathered from around the web that will mm -hmm. allow you to see, well, what are we currently doing? What are we going through? And uh, what's the bright side to all of this? 
So yes, Christina, as, as designers, it's true that we often uh, ideate or generate ideas and evaluate ideas based on what we already know. It means business targets or specific personal with specific gender, age, tech literacy, educational context, social network, or purchasing power. But doing this, we make things mm, that are easy for some people to use, but difficult for everyone else who is not being considered as normal. So our ambition must be to create products, experiences that are physically, cognitively, and emotionally appropriate for everybody. And we need to see the human diversity as a great resource uh, for better designs. So the problem with exclusion is that it talks to a bigger sense towards discrimination and then if it gets deeper, it can even become violence. And this is represented through racism, sexism, and ableism where we're just uh, continuously excluding and discriminating people who are much more vulnerable or that are in social minorities. So bias, prejudices, the stereotypes, and lack of representation impair an individual's ability to express themselves as whole human beings. And I think that this stereotypes, on one side, this bias that we have, is just a quick way for us to analyze our context and just navigate through the world. But the problem is that stereotypes serve as a justification of toxic, toxic practices and reinforce discriminatory attitudes within uh, or digital experiences. And as much as we want to improve the future, we continue replicating things that are continuously toxic within our society. So there's a really big opportunity and need in us uh, modeling what could be the future. So to give you some data around the web, uh, about online harassment, well, 40% of the interviewers in 2014 by Pew Research have experienced it, 73 have seen it. And what's particularly depressing, and welcome to say it, is that um, young women are the ones who are put at the focus and are the ones who experience or are most likely to experience online harassment, that being that being stalked, sexually harassed, physically threatened, and lived through sustained harassment. And this is women between eight, 18 and 24 years old. Now about what's going on in the panorama of the tech industry, something that's really impressive is just analyzing that who actually run this industry is mostly male, that gives us a 75% in terms of gender. And this is just seen through a three-dimensional uh, aspect of gender. Now, in terms of um, ethnicity and nationality, well, Native American and Asian, Black, Latino, uh, Pacific Islander are just a very, very small percentage in comparison to the 57% or more that can uh, be through people who are actually white. Now, something that I found some very interesting is um, I've heard the sign does a design census every year, and they want to analyze what is the current panorama of people who are designing in, in a technology environment. So uh, they do their re research a bit, bit deeper in understanding gender all the way from female to non-binary, non-conforming, gender fluid, and allowing users to decide if they want to be defined by their gender. And something that's just right is that uh, in comparison to the 75% of males that are running the tech industry, 61% are or females are designing those experiences. And uh, ethnicity, it's um, also 71% white or Caucasian. You can read more in 
uh, the design census. It, this happens every year, so probably uh, this is an invitation for you to participate. And yeah, that's it. And I did mention that there was a brighter tone into all the statistics. So this is a comparison between millennials and Generation Z. Uh, so um, they found out that 56% of Generation Z know somebody who goes by neutral pronouns like they or they. So that means that it's coming more and more common within our society to have a different representation of our genders that is just not uh, only bi-dimensional. And that 81% consider that gender does not define a person as much as it used to. So that's definitely a brighter picture of how we understand gender and how it will probably change for the future. Okay, so now we're going to talk again a little bit about the disability. Uh, we have been talking about disability for a long, but um, what does it actually mean? Well, in 1980, disability was a personal attribute, so the World Health Organization described it like a lack of ability to perform an activity in the manner considered normal for a human being. But things are changing and evolving by, by adding more um, complexity and more dimensions. So in 2018, disability was defined as context dependent by the World Health Organization. It says uh, disability is not just a health problem, it's a complex phenomenon reflecting the interaction between features of a person's body and features of the society in which they live. So, this means that everyone can experience a disability throughout their life. So disabilities can be uh, permanent. For example, you are uh, you are blind or deaf, or you have only one arm or leg. So this irreversible health injury may imply some restrictions when you interact with the wall around, but not always. If you think uh, in a person or if you uh, are in a wheelchair and you are using your computer, there's no restriction, no problem with you interacting with the, this device. Then we have the temporary uh, disabilities. So, for example, a short-term injury, you have broken your arm, you have got eye surgery, or another example could be the context, and you will have to carry too heavy luggage in public transport. So this context uh, may affect the way you also interact with the, the world around you in a temporary way. And mainly, we have some disabilities that can be situational. So uh, as People, we move through different kind of environments, so our ab abilities can also change. And in some situations, as when you are driving a car, and you are visually impaired, and at the same time doing tasks with one hand, like for example, checking your GP GPS, and you are also in a situation, you, you are disabled because of the situation. So um, one of the companies who's doing a wonderful job in talking about inclusive design is like they even have an anti-discrimination team, which is led by uh, Benjamin Evans. And I love this quote that I heard from the Design Better podcast, Ben and Vision. And it says that to have bias is to be human. And the problem is not that we have bias, it's just that we're unaware of the way it affects the work that we do. So I did mention this before. Uh, but just to be more straightforward, we all have biases. This allows us to understand the universe where we're, we're living, the context that we're going through, and it, it creates these shortcuts that allow us to understand very quickly what's going on. 
the problem here is that it creates some uh, limitations in the way that we understand others. So um, from another perspective is uh, technology is playing a big part in how we interact every day, how we learn, how we remember things. And they've been enabled us to do things that we never dreamed of and reach our full potential through a different dimension. But as we continue innovating and creating digital experiences, are we actually being conscious of who's adapting to who? And are we even uh, considering that we're taking all our toxic behaviors that uh, exist within our uh, current reality into this platform? And also um, creating this disruption that becomes exponential as we have a, a global environment through the uh, digital experience. So in a way, we're just potentializing what we're currently living. And that could be both wonderful and dangerous. So Christina, to conclude, uh, to close with this part, and uh, what we can say is that every design, design decision we make has the potential to include or exclude. So now let's go through inclusive design some principles and examples. So as I mentioned before, inclusive design is a methodology, a philosophy, and even a mentality. It's about considering real life individuality and aiming to adapt the digital experiences to the world's panorama by embracing the things that makes us human. So it's just design that reflects our current reality and makes us be better. So uh, I gathered some principles from around the web. This is considering uh, Kat Holmes' um, suggestions through Meets Mismatch, uh, Microsoft Inclusive Design principles, and also what our friends in Airbnb design have been preaching for a long time. So I'll guide you through these four steps from recognizing, learning, solving, and extending, and finally, what's the ideal picture for design? So for starters, we need to recognize exclusion. Thing is, exclusion happens when we solve problems from our own biases. Ideally, by understanding exactly how and why people are excluded, uh, we can, it can help us establish concrete steps towards being more inclusive. So here are some steps that I recommend for each and every one of us to take into consideration. Step one is just identifying our assumptions. Challenge your own bias. Challenge how we're making things. Question the process. And make this a core part of your workflow. This is not something that you will uh, do as step one in every, uh, in every single one of your projects, but it's something that you should do continuously. What are our assumptions? What are our biases? And the most important uh, question and the second one is, who are we missing? So search for exclusion points. Search for the people that are missing within that conversation, who are missing from that product, and use that to generate new ideas and highlight opportunities. As we mentioned from the benefits, recognizing this exclusion can lead to innovation and can lead for you to attend a certain unmet need from the market. And last but not least, in this recognizing the exclusion, it's very important to question ourselves, but also the organizations where we work. So uh, first thing would be to review the inclusion policies of the organization so that we can be very prepared to model requirements and understand the values that drive uh, these um, organization and these businesses so that you can either um, be better are at argumenting why this is important and that you can find uh, something that could be potentially risky for uh, all of these businesses. Okay, so we have a couple of stories. Uh, the FinTech app and an announcement service. So I worked for a while on this FinTech app. It was a service that was aimed for the Latino community in the United States. Four personas seemed pretty normal, in a sense. Uh, they had interviewed some of the people 
that uh, went into their off into their office to understand their service. And what we found out is that we weren't considering the visual impairments that these people may have, mm -hmm. because even though that we did consider their age, we weren't really, well, we were aware, but we weren't taking into consideration how this might affect the product. So as you become of age, this also represents uh, a disability that at first can become uh, momentarily, but mm -hmm. then eventually becomes permanent. Mm -hmm. And this could be visual, this could be maybe somebody who has Parkinson's, and maybe the type of, um, what do you say, uh, cognitive abilities that you may have when interacting uh, with this type of product. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, this was for the Latino community. So having somebody who had uh, a real understanding of the terms and context of these humans was very important. Me <laughs> as a Latina was a, a definitely good asset for the project, I guess. So. Uh, this is a project that was built and born in San Francisco. Uh, it was a very diverse group, which is something that uh, is really good, and I'll tell you why in the next steps. Uh, this was this girl from India, uh, this girl that was raised and born in LA, mm -hmm. and Latina. So we really contributed about understanding the mistakes that we were making and the assumptions for our personas, and then interviewing them and really having a clearer picture of the things that we needed to improve. And it started as uh, the contrast and the size of the fonts. And those tiny details really made a difference in the experience for our older audience. That's a good story. Yeah. <laughs> I have another one. So a few years ago, I designed a small ads um, online service for the French national um, postal company, in which people um, post their announcement uh, to offer or um, request services like home cleaning, educational support, housework, or assistance to the other. Nevertheless, providing uh, an online experience exclusively, we were missing one of our targets, to the other. So um, the elders who weren't able to use a computer or a smartphone. And that happens a lot in Europe, but you know, okay. in general all over the world. So for that reason, we uh, had to find an alternative service path offline this time to allow these users uh, to access uh, to the service and in, in, our, in our new alternative path, the elders only had to go to the postal office to benefit of this service. That was true for the elders, but also for the rest of the users that maybe they, they don't have a, a smartphone or a computer, they have connectivity issues, issues or whatever, they, uh, they could go to the office, uh, to the postal office to subscribe to the service and to uh, benefit of uh, our this offer and request. That's an amazing story. Thank you, Anthony. So what I love about what you just shared is that you took into consideration the service as a whole and having a design experience just this one of the different channels that the user can, can use to complete their task. Mm -hmm. Being there in presence allowed uh, a wider spectrum of your mm -hmm. users to uh, get access to the, mm -hmm. to the service. Yeah. So that's awesome. So now next to the second principle, and this is just learning from diversity. Uh, we want to design to embrace things that makes us human. Include and learn from people with a large range of perspectives, covering in variation and capabilities, needs, and aspirations. So, first of all, you want to seek out awareness. You want to take time to learn how people are currently adapting to the world around them from their perspective. How are they currently experiencing exclusion? How, uh, what are the 
steps that they're taking so that they can break this exclusion and actually go through their services. Who are they asking for help? And uh, how are they hijacking our service in a way so that they can complete the things that they need to do? We want to also stop reinforcing stereotypes. We want to resolve the tension between current conventions. Then, seek diverse thinking. Uh, you cannot be inclusive you know, if you don't have a diverse team. So this is uh, why, what I meant with my example before about having such a diverse team. It brings different perspectives. It brings different visions of how reality should behave like and allows you to have a bigger conversation. And this takes me to the last step, we wanna create space for that. As a team, it would be very enlightening if you define a principle that can guide the decisions and align a clear vision of success. So Ray Dalio wrote a huge book about principles and how this allowed him to be a much more successful investor. And I think this applies to anybody and every product and every company, because if we have a principle, it will be so much easier for us to take decisions having this vision already structured. So we won't make the same decisions based on different principles, because if we're only thinking about maybe belonging to a core principle, as it is for Airbnb, based on the problems that our customers are facing, we would take one or another path. And it has no story related to that. So in one of my previous agencies, we hired for the first time a person with um, a disability. So we integrated in our design team uh, a new UX designer with a hearing uh, impairment. So he wasn't only a um, wonderful example of overcoming, but he was also the trigger of a new era for, for our design team. So he led to a big change because he taught us to become um, uh, to become uh, to be aware of the way we were designing. Um, he taught us to take into account other kind of users that are not normal for society standards and moreover through uh, his experience uh, adapting to the world around him uh, or interacting with the world around him he guided us uh, on how to become a more adaptive and more inclusive design team also so we include in our team uh, more diversity other point of views and that make our design better. I think that thing that's really important is to keep on adding different advocates for different struggles yeah. so that we can become aware of what others are going through and of their mission of life. So it's amazing that you yeah. had Marie's different yes. yes. project. It was amazing to, to design with him, with him because the, he, thanks to him, I, I learned a lot about accessibility, of course, and, and inclusive design. So, thank you, Maurice. <laughs> <laughs> you are watching this. <laughs> uh, so, I heard another story online. So, this is from Benjamin, again, the design lead for um, anti discrimination team in Airbnb. So in one of his talks, and this really stuck with me, is that before working at Airbnb, he uh, had a flight to somewhere in South America, and he had everything scheduled down for, he had already spoken to his host, and everything was looking good. I think he paid it in advance, as we do with Airbnb. And the moment that he arrived, uh, this host receives him at the door and tells him, like, you know, he cannot stay. And he was like, but why? I just come from a very long trip. It was like more than 20 hours journey. Why are you telling me that I cannot stay? And this person replied that, yeah, well, you can't stay because you're black. So, thing is, 
this was a, a, a breaking point for him, in a sense, and eventually he came to, to work at Airbnb and just uh, having his uh, personal experience within the teams that we worked with. And he realized that it's not Airbnb's fault that there are some discrimination and that there is racism, racism within the world, but it is an opportunity and it is its duty in the sense that they're putting users in danger or in possible danger by exposing them to hosts that could have this type of mentality. So uh, for them, as I mentioned, the principle that allowed them to be uh, the driver of this new design decisions was bonding. And uh, this has changed the way that they create the profiles with an Airbnb so that we can have a fuller picture of who the person is beyond gender, ethnicity, uh, nationality, color of skins, religion, and so on. Uh, if you want to hear more about this session, you should definitely look it up. It's in, in YouTube. And now going through our third principle. You want to solve for one and extend to many. You want to connect the dots. You want to connect the people in similar circumstances. Thing is, a solution that works well for someone with limitations, disabilities, or constraints may also benefit another, even if the, the scenario is different. So you want to find edge cases, and you want to embrace them and make that part of your product experience. They represent unmet needs of your users, and that's just a new point that you can tackle them. And you want to define these constraints. After you've talked to people, you understand how they're living exclusion. You want to create these constraints so that you can build up on, up on them and create better design decisions. And you want to consider the persona spectrum. I'll tell you more about this tool in one second. Uh, you want to understand related mismatches and motivation across the spectrum of scenarios. And you want to make a case. So it's enough that you uh, have a, an enlightening experience, but you need to align users' needs to core business decisions. Thing is, um, we all want to be good people, but we may not always have the time to do so. Or maybe this is not a priority within our company. But there is definitely a way to have a priority if this brings more revenue, if this allows us to mitigate some risks of the business. And by matching this user's needs to core business decisions, we make sure to align the full strategy to the benefit of the company. So don't be afraid of speaking out to other representatives within your company if you're making a good case for this users. It's also an opportunity. So we have a couple of stories. <laughs> so as I mentioned, I'm a big fan of Airbnb. And the way that they designed their current filters was just by considering uh, how this would affect people who have disabilities. What do they need to consider from users uh, that need very specific um, understanding of how this um, place would look like? if there's an elevator, if there are certain steps, if, uh, uh, if it's suitable for somebody who has a disability, if I'm wearing a wheelchair, would I be able to access the place? So their Airbnb uh, filters work in a way that, well, it not only allows you to understand this, if this space will suit somebody who has a disability, but in a sense, it also brings a much more accuracy level for everyone else. So uh, I think that's a great story mm -hmm. and a quick win for Airbnb. Definitely. So I have also a great anecdote uh, related to this one. When I was studying my career in industrial design, I remember our teacher asking us to design different kind of products. And I also remember uh, that my team <laughs> and I um, firstly thought products um, for persons with disabilities. For example, a torch lamp uh, for a person without a hand. Or 
also we started ideating in extreme context. Uh, for example, our teacher asked us to design a high chair for kids. Okay, so we decided to, uh, to think the high chair for kids, but in hospitals. Because they, they, they have another kind of, of needs and, and constraints also. So we often use this approach as an innovation driver before. So the idea behind was simple, as we have said, Christina, if we are able to make a product um, for people with these constraints, we could extend our solution to, to the others. And finally, uh, design a product that is open to all because it covers uh, people who, who, who can experience some uh, disabilities uh, when with some restrictions when uh, they are using the, the product. That was okay. <laughs> finally, the teacher asked us, please, <laughs> just to stop making products for people with disabilities because now it's too much. <laughs> but it's funny. It's a great story. Yeah. <laughs> so I promised that I would tell you a bit more about the Persona Spectrum. This is a tool that you can find in Microsoft Inclusive tool Toolkit from 2016. And, and it's a quick tool to help you foster empathy and to show how a solution can scale to a broader audience. As you remember, the principle is solve for one and extend to many. So uh, this will allow you to understand related mismatches and motivations across the spectrum of permanent, temporary, and situational scenarios. So the idea is that you can understand through uh, the product that you're building how this will affect through these three uh, different spectrums. And this can go all the way through uh, speaking disabilities, um, visual impairments, and so on. Definitely uh, look it up. And it's just a really great way of tackling down the different scenarios and edge cases that your users may go through. And the thing is, designing with constraints in mind is just Designing well. And this takes us to our last principle design for reflection and belonging. We want to design interventions that encourage calm and introspective thinking and actually empower users, foster empathy and reflections as a positive of fear, encourage mindful and self aware online behavior that meeting their ends. So this sounds very idealistic, and let me tell you how you can achieve that. First, you want to burst your audience bubble. Just as it happens in the business, where you're just trying to make a, a statement and have everybody on board, you need to onboard your audience on why this is important. You want to match their user's narrative of the world, be actually different, and use it as an opportunity to raise awareness. Thing is, you've been through a journey. You understand why this is important. Your audience doesn't. So they may feel manipulated by what you're trying to put on. This is why it's very important to have them on board. And this takes me to the last point, but um, it's just about being transparent. You can share what you're doing with your audience. At the end, it's just building thin things where we can all belong. And it's just good nature. We want to design interactions that drive empathy. And this is by taking into consideration the limits that people may experience. And if it comes to it, also embrace, embrace friction. I know that as designers, sometimes we really think like we want this seamless experience. So good design is the type of design the user doesn't really uh, know that he's going through. But if this is helping your audience adopt new experiences and uh, adopt uh, a new perspective and uh, higher meaning and generate reflection, definitely go for it. A little friction can make the difference between having a host that receives you at home uh, or having a host that tells you you cannot stay because you're black. So embrace friction. Just make the difference for your users and, uh, the, through a digital experience.
So I found this uh, website online. It's slaveryfootprint.org. Uh, I really love, well, the idea behind it is allows you to be much more aware of how many slaves and in the industries uh, that actually purchase from uh, are um, working on the products that we use every day. And it takes you by the hand and just analyzing the things that you consume on a daily basis or a month basis and tells you uh, how in different parts of the world uh, there's, there's still slave work. So definitely look it up. It's just uh, a great example of how we can design for reflection and belonging. So let me take you just super quick about how does this methodology affect the final product? So how does this actually look like when uh, done right? So first, taking into consideration the rest and accurate representation. Open Bits by Pablo Stanley is just uh, a big library of tools of people that is just open, that means free, and very diverse. Yeah, it's really fun to play with. And uh, in comparison, yet again, I'm in love with Airbnb strategy. Can <laughs> I read more about the illustrator? So what you can see in this illustration is that it's very subtle, subtle, that you can see people from different nationalities and ethnicities, and also that having a disability is just a regular part of our world. We want to be as transparent as possible of our current reality. We, want, we don't want to add makeup to it. So it's very important that we actually give a good representation of the people that live in the world currently. Then, uh, about language names and pronouns, Etsy profile uh, caters for all its types of users through a custom field. So that means that we're not only bidimensional in considering gender just as female and male, we also allow them to skip it if they don't want to be specific about their gender or customize it so that they really feel the presence of the uh, Facebook takes uh, the same approach by allowing them to add it, but uh, I really like that they consider uh, how do you, how would you rather be uh, congratulated for your birthday? So this adds a sweet uh, perspective and approach into how we can ask uh, this type of things to our users. Then, uh, just for your consideration, the world, the word of 2019 from Miriam Webster was they as a pronoun, and uh, it's used to refer a single person whose gender identity is non-binary. And last but not least, the management of personal data. This could be asking about a person's gender could be a triggering experience. So we want to use language that's clear, welcoming, and reassuring of how are we keeping your information safe? And why are we doing this? Like maybe this person that is still struggling with their identity is really scared that they can um, be in the wrong hands. What are we doing to protect their uh, personal data? And and now let's go to accessibility. Exactly, let's go ahead with accessibility. So as we have said at the beginning of this talk, accessibility is an attribute that indicates the level uh, to which a service, tool, product is made user-friendly uh, to the greatest number of users. So then we have the accessible design. So it's a process where people that experience disabilities, impaired vision or difficulty with motor skills, etc., are specifically taken into account uh, during the, the process. So the web content accessibility guidelines have been introduced to read barriers that were in place for those uh, users uh, with different abilities when it came to navigating websites. So the guidelines cover a wide range of recommendations for making web content um, more accessible, and that's a bit. And note that depending on how you satisfy these guidelines or requirements, 
your website and will have a conformance level. So you want to have a detail of uh, all these requirements, guidelines, you'll find the link on the presentation. And on our side, uh, we have been based on these guidelines to explain you some of the best practices regarding accessibility. So let's take a look. So the first uh, guideline is perceivable. So every web content should be perceived for any user, at least with one sense. So the vision, the here, or the depth. To make a content completely perceivable, available, it must be displayed in different ways without losing information. So you can use, for example, for an image, and the audio description, or you can use it, uh, also the branded transcription or simplified language. So as I say, uh, here's an example of uh, best practice. So non-text content must be explained differently. Um, this means that the images of your website or app must have a hidden description. So these hidden texts are readable by screen readers and allow low vision users to hear the web and correctly understand the sense of the images. So try to describe um, the, the images, what's happening in this picture, instead of saying something like picture, <laughs> okay? So if the image is poorly, sometimes the images could be poorly decorative or creates redundancy regarding to the context and the text. Um, so in this case, you can ask just an empty attribute and skip a screen readers escape this, um, skip this image. These descriptions must be short, clear, and finish uh, by a point, because the screen readers uh, make a post after. So it's important uh, to not forget this detail. So let's see an example. Uh, as host, for those who doesn't know, uh, it's an online fashion and cosmetic retailer. So on this app, uh, when you can, when you use the voice assistant, the image description explains the product they are selling instead of uh, talking about well, the thing that we can see in the in the image. So this is a very good practice for e-commerce websites and apps. It's extremely important to be focused on the product, on the description of the product instead, instead of uh, what is happening in, the, in this picture, in this image. So here, uh, in our example, the, the screen readers uh, say pinky straight fit chin with split hem in blue. So it's the, the brand, you have the brand and the description of the product and then the price. Instead of saying woman wearing a straight fit chin. If I want to buy the jeans, it's more useful the first uh, combination. So you can use um, an, uh, solutions to generate automatically alternative text. So you can, for example, Amazon recognition or Clovinary. So these tools don't replace uh, a manual translation, but they can help you to, to gain time. And of course, uh, maybe it's hard to use it uh, in e-commerce platforms because you, you need to, to um, explain the detail of the product website, so, as I have said. I love your example for the pinky <laughs> straight yeah. I think it's so important that we consider all of the senses while we're going through our platform. And this is just a very bright example of how it's not only dependent on the site, but also that we can understand what's going on mm. for, for hearing. Another good practice is mm, when you are communicating something important, showing an action or prompting a response, just don't use a color alone to make this critical information understandable. So it can be challenging for people with low visual acuity or color blindness to uh, understand the new content. So 
we try to use an extra indicator, for example, uh, a text level or um, a pattern, uh, a shape, something that uh, can explain uh, the, the meaning of, uh, of what you are trying to, to say with the curve. So uh, when you show errors, for example, don't rely also on, on color test alone. You can add icons and introduce also some um, visualis some some animations or for example if you use it in in Nana uh, you can use also the font vibration and we are going to see an example regarding related to that. Oh I have a fun story. <laughs> so uh, this was my first job as a UX designer for maybe second I can remember. Uh, and I was transitioning from uh, running an editorial designer to a UX. So this was my first big project. And I was very excited to be part of this. I worked on some uh, flows for different types of users. And I was going through it with my key stakeholder through this. And he just listened to me very patiently. And I was just like telling him like, oh, OK, for this user, uh, this is the scenario, blah, 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 uh, uh, how success looks like, and uh, what happens if it goes uh, wrong, and so on, how I was considering different perspective. I just really wanted to, to see that I was doing my work all right. Uh, he waited patiently until I finished my, my explanation. And he just told me, well, it sounds amazing. Thing is, I couldn't follow through everything that you were explaining because I'm colorblind. And what I had done with my clothes is just rely completely on colors, yeah. red and green. And he was not able to see the difference between well, both of those colors. So uh, I just wanted to find a quick uh, way of making this adjustment so that he could give me feedback in the moment. So emojis came to the rescue and I just <laughs> added this quick uh, images uh, as key to each card so that he could see right away what was the flow for each and mm -hmm. what happened at the path when uh, straight or wrong. Yeah, and these icons, these emojis can work pretty well yeah. uh, when you use uh, the red on the on the green color, you say that's right on this mode. So. Exactly works perfect. So uh, in this case, my user was also my stakeholder because the things that I was creating for us to be in alignment of what we were going to build next uh, were also needed to consider what is the happens. So here's an example of good practice. <laughs> and firstly, we have the PayPal app. So when users try to move forward a uh, transaction without filling the amount, we get the, a visual and also physical vibration feedback to say, hey, you have uh, forgotten the, the amount uh, to continue with the transaction. In this side, in this example, the call to action is not displayed as unable to maintain, maintain enough contrast for users with a uh, visual impairment. This is uh, a good thing, a good practice. Another great example of this guideline is Trello's colorblind mode. So when you turn on this mode, levels become more accessible by adding a, pad, a texture, a pattern. So for this, you can use um, also plugins or simulators mm -hmm. to make sure that there's enough color contrast on your interface, and the simulators allows you to to be sure that uh, persons with uh, visual impairments or colorblind um, persons can uh, can see correctly the, the different colors of your interface and understand the, the content. So I recommend you to get started with some uh, plugin. And color. Then our second guideline is operable. So every feature must be 
accessible thanks to a clear navigation system and users must have guidance elements to position themselves in the interface. And it's really, really important to, for people with disabilities, but also for the interest of users. So one of the best practices to consider the levels, position, size, color contrast, and vibrations. So using placeholder test text as labels is one of the biggest mistakes when designing a form. Placeholder test is usually small, gray, and, and has low contrast. So it's hard to read. So any non-label text as placeholder text are generally skipped over by screen readers when you use the tab, um, the tab key. And it can become becomes really confusing for for users with, with cognitive disabilities that are using the, this tab key to navigate through the form. So always in general, how we, we need always to help people to understand what they should do or write in a form. And it's best if the labels uh, don't go away when you are feeling the, an input, mm -hmm. so because um, in this way, and people should have and should never lose this context. At the same time, and they are waiting, right? So please don't sacrifice usability in favor of um, simplicity. So I have another story about the fighting of FinTech and people. So I already mentioned that they were older in age and that this was something that we really need to consider as uh, the way that we were designing our interface. Uh, what we noticed is that when they were writing down their passwords, is that it became very frustrating because we were required them a high level of uh, security for their passwords mm -hmm. because this was a FanFag uh, app and it was money related, so we needed to be very secure. So something that we did in that uh, particular scenario is that we added uh, every detail of the things that the password should consider. So at the time that they were typing down their password, yeah. it will start telling them that, yeah. okay, you've completed this, you've completed this, and, and have it uh, both, uh, both visually and in color and also in an icon that to, to your first guideline and giving them context of how by filling their password in the correct way, they can be able to uh, go to the next step. Mm -hmm. You give the, this guidance to users uh, to know on that if on what they are writing is it's right. Yeah, and just to make uh, it secure for them to continue to send the platform. Mm -hmm. That's good, for sure. So we will go ahead with a, a best practice example. So you first sign up form, use levels to, to introduce placeholders. So these um, text levels are written in black, so there's enough contrast with the background. Moreover, required files are specified are specified using text instead of and stories. And thanks to that, if you have low vision and you use a screen reader, the screen reader will be able to read the name of the file and explain and specify at the same time if the file is required or, or not. So then we have the third guideline is understandable. So all textual information on the site or app must be readable and understandable regardless of user knowledge. Besides, the pages must appear in a predictable uh, sequence. So let's move to the best practice. So our best practice is about headings. Headings mark where the content starts. They also establish the hierarchy of the content of the page. 
So title, titles with big font sizes help readers to understand the order of the content, but screen readers navigate into web pages uh, by having a structure hierarchically. So when, thanks to that, you can listen the page just mm, with the tab key. You can list other headings and jump the content by types of titles or navigate directly to the top level headings. So it's really, really important to mark up the headings correctly, not only with the typography, but to mark them correctly in your code, because that may affect the way your users understand the, the website and hear your website. In terms of accessibility, it's an important thing to, to take into account. Awesome. Uh, so, Paris is uh, part of our development team. He's uh, in our Querétaro office in, in Mexico. And he's a really passionate advocate for accessibility. He gives this talk, I think, uh, once every couple of months on accessibility. And he has this awesome living experience. Uh, he's visually impaired, so for him, it's well, it's been a struggle dealing with certain interfaces when they don't respect the markups or the labels. So what he suggests is that we all have the living experience of how the voiceover works, how the screen reader goes through and navigates through, through a screen, and how it feels like when you're going from tab to tab, how long does it take you as a user to finish one task. So if I could recommend you something, if you cannot get to, to be part of this uh, talk that parties gives or workshop, definitely go comment at F5 on your computer and start going through a screen reader in any page that you're um, working so that you can make sure that whoever is on the receiving end of the things that you produce can actually finish their task and mm -hmm. that the markups are right, that the labels are being read, and that uh, you're taking into consideration the description of each image. That's wonderful, Christina. You can also use the Chrome and Firefox uh, provide an extension. They provide uh, an extension that analyzes uh, your website mm -hmm. and show you the errors in the content structure. And they show you if uh, the headings uh, are correctly marked. And just to be sure that uh, there isn't any problem in the information structure to help these users like, uh, like Paris to navigate to the, to the website. Yeah. And we, we have uh, used this uh, Chrome uh, tool extension, heading maps. Uh, to find a website that uh, it's a bad practice of this uh, guideline. Because in this case, we have the Accent Runs website. And in this case, well, the level two heading is missing. So we have the level one, the level three, but not the level two. So uh, for people using these screen readers, must be a little bit confusing to navigate uh, through this website and maybe also for the rest of the users but in another video. And finally, we have robots. So it's in the, the fourth and guideline for today. So the site and app um, must be able to adapt to all kinds of browsers or US on devices and work with assistive technologies. It's very important. You should also take into account the connectivity because in order to avoid a frustrating experience, it's also that not everyone takes into account this, but it's important when you charge the, the website to have some elements of the website that um, appears, even if all the, the page isn't uh, already charged. 
So here we can see uh, our favorite <laughs> website, Airbnb, <laughs> which, which fits perfectly according to the resolution of our screen of our device. And moreover, by the way, uh, Airbnb is also a good example of inclusive service and interface design approach. So let's move to the next. Okay. Part. So the next part is just putting into practice everything that we've just mentioned right now. So we have this exercise prepared for you. We'll guide you through uh, everything that there is to, to know and understand. And yeah. So the goal for this exercise is that you want to create the scenario for a user that wants to book a train ticket from Ho Chi Minh to Hoi An, because we're in Vietnam, through a transport reservation website. And our personas look like this. First, you have the foreigner. Uh, his name is Oles. He is 32 years old, non-binary influencer from Copenhagen, Denmark. And he's traveling in Vietnam for one month as a backpacker. He always carries his camera and he wants to upload content to his YouTube channel. Then uh, the, the elder, Mike, uh, 72 years old, female, retired from Ho Chi Minh. She wants to celebrate her sister's birthday in Hoi An and bring her some presents. Next, the Norwegian traveler, C, who's 24 years old, a male, he's a translator, he lives in Ho Chi Minh. He uses his laptop and he wants to spend a weekend with some of his friends in Hoi An. He always travels with his dog, Paco. And last but not least, uh, the family dad. It's Kong and his kids, Luna, three years old, Jan, six years old, and Frank, nine years old. He's 40. Uh, he's male, currently unemployed. He's from Ho Chi Minh. He uses his mobile phone and his laptop. And he just wants to spend a weekend with his family in Hoi An, even if traveling with luggages and kids is quite challenging. So, which characteristic the service or which characteristics we, we consider that the service must have to create an all-inclusive web experience for all of these users. You can choose one of these personas to design for one and to solve for the others. So take a big look into all of these users and just choose one so you can create an experience that could help them all. Mm -hmm. So the goal of this exercise is finally to put into practice on the inclusive uh, design principles and accessibility guidelines that we have learned uh, all along uh, with this course, this talk. And do you have any question regarding the ex this exercise or just you want to share with us your outcomes? Please feel free to contact us on social media or LinkedIn or also, we'd love to hear from you and um, however your outcomes look like, or if you have any questions. So hopefully with this exercise, you'll get to practice a bit of empathy and just analyze how this inclusive perspective would look, look into your design process. So now for the takeaways, just a quick brief recap of what we've been talking about. So again, inclusive design is just this methodology and philosophy that just allows us to understand the diverse uh, range of perspective and characteristics that exist within or human abilities. And the principles is just first recognizing exclusion, learning from diversity, solving for one and extending to many, and designing for reflection and belonging. Then accessibility, which is just an attribute that is also considered in the inclusive design methodology, consider the guidelines of uh, it being perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And I guess that's it. That's it. What's your name?
Thank you so much for your time. We really hope that you enjoyed the session and that it has become, in a way, enlightening and that you can start putting into practice all of the suggestions that we have prepared for you. Thank you very much to visualize this, uh, this talk. And um, we will be glad again to, to answer any of your questions. Thank you, and we hope to see you again uh, for the next uh, Academy webinar or talk or workshop. Thank you, and Thank have you. a wonderful day. <laughs> Bye.